Let's go on to Mac. How, how, do, we, how do we define anesthetic potency? A bro broader question. When I say potency, we're doing a, a Rorschach. What do you think? What do you think? Potency? How do I think about it? <laughs> well, what word pops in your mind? Mac value. Mac value pops in your mind. What else pops in your mind? What are other indices? OK, so reasons why you get potency pop into your mind as well. But are, are there other Macs in this life besides Mac itself? What are the other Macs? Big Mac and what else? Mac bar. There's Mac bar. What's Mac bar? It's the blending of the um, adrenergic response. Right. So it's the, the, the minimum alveolar concentration that blocks the adrenergic or autonomic response, that concentration. What else? There is Mac awake. Okay, what's Mac awake? Mac awake is the minimal alveolar concentration at which 50% of patients will respond to command. Right. Appropriately. 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 We'll see, we'll see an example of that in a little bit. Why do we why do we choose 50% rather than 90% or 95%? Why? Because MAC value slightly above that will affect primarily 95 to 100% of the patients. So MAC 50 tells you what MAC 90 is. It's very close to MAC 90. But is there an experimental reason why we don't use MAC 90 or MAC 95? Well, yeah. My answer to the previous question was I thought it, this would make an easier experimental model, actually, when they were designing the original studies to determine what MAC was when they would actually, you know, choose if someone responded or did not respond, that's kind of a one and two response. They could continually do that and figure out the 50% value the easiest. That's the answer. That's really the answer. That the 50% 50, 50 response is almost always the easiest response to determine with the least number of experimental subjects. And then when you combine it with the fact that it really does tell you where the 90% is within a few percent of the MAC value itself, uh, that makes the determination at 50%, the really logical one to do. That is, if you take the percent responding and you increase your anesthetic concentration, remember MAC is the 50% and this is 100% up here, we go along and then suddenly it goes down like this. Over here, you get a lot of variability. Variability is very great. But right here, the variability is very small, which makes the numbers that you have to acquire in order to define this point much smaller. In fact, you might have to give anesthesia to 10 times as many patients to get the ED95, to find the 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 who does or doesn't respond than you do at the 50% point. So that's why you choose 50 rather than 90 or 95. There is the definition of MAC, and it is as we said. What part of the central nervous system mediates this capacity of inhaled anesthetics to produce immobility? Which one? We got a lady who hasn't answered many questions here. The spinal cord. The spinal cord. It isn't the brain. It isn't the brain. We used to think it was the brain. When I went into anesthesia 250 years ago, we thought the brain controlled everything. Well, it isn't. The spinal cord is the part of the central nervous system uh, that produces MAC or mediates MAC. How do we know that? How do we know it's a spinal cord? If you sever the connection between the brain and the spinal cord, it doesn't alter the MAC. That's the answer. There's another answer as well, but that's, um, that's the one that Ira Rampel proposed. Joe Antonini proposed an, another experimental model and used it to show that it was, again, the spinal cord rather than the brain. Does anyone know what Antonini did? Michael, what did Antonini do? Was that the model with the sheep where they have a, a vertebral flow that goes to the spinal cord but not to the core? I'm you're not you're onto it. <laughs> you're onto it. Quinn's going to help you. It was a selective perfusion studies in goats where they could cannulate the carotid arteries and that only perfused the brain and then they would use the rest of the systemic circulation to perfuse the spinal cord. Right. right. What did they find? Well, they found that uh, to abolish movement 
by administering the anesthetic to the cerebral circulation, you had to deliver a significantly higher concentration than you did for the systemic or the yeah. spinal cord circulation. How much, how much higher? I'm guessing, but I think it's five or six times. In some experiments, it was that much higher. In the initial experiments they did, it was about three times higher. And in some cases, they could never get immobility by perfusing the brain, no matter what concentration they used. This is an illustration uh, from Rample's work showing the two places that Rample cut the connection between higher centers over here in a rat and lower centers over here. There's one section, and here is the second section. And then, as was said, what Rample found was that when you severed the connection, you made the animal decerebrate, over the passage of time after decerebration, there was no change, and this didn't differ from a control animal in which the severing was not accomplished. So this was an animal in whom there was a sham operation done, but no severing of the higher centers from the lower centers. So that pretty well proves that the spinal cord is the primary mediator of the uh, capacity of inhaled anesthetics to produce immobility. What about intravenous anesthetics, such as propofol? Does that work on the cord? No, they found that that works both on the brain and the cord, I felt. And the cord effect is minimal. So it's only a really slight effect on the cord. It's almost all the brain. So propofol causes immobility. Yeah, you, you can give a propofol anesthetic, but it's because propofol is doing something to the brain. And we may even talk about that a little bit when we talk about mechanisms of anesthesia. How do we determine MAC in an animal? How are we going to do that? I think you're looking at movement versus non-movement. So what we were talking about before, you're getting 50% with movement, 50% with non-movement. You're looking at the uh, amounts of anesthetic that are delivered, and then you get a crossover between the two. What do you mean by amounts of anesthetic that are delivered? Concentration. Concentration. Concentration where? In the alveolus. In the, say it louder. In the more alveolus. more loudly. <laughs> Again. The alveolus. What does MAC Alveoli. stand for? That's the uh, alveolar concentration at which right. you see 50 percent. It's the minimum alveolar. Why the alveolar concentration? Why well, not the inspire? Why not the vaporizer? Well, that's going to most accurately reflect the brain concentration or, or the spinal cord concentration. Exactly in so. This case. Exactly so. What do you have to do to ensure that it's reflecting the spinal cord concentration? Well, you have to wait till they've equalized. You yeah. can't just right. start at the beginning. That's all. That's, you, you give them the answer. You can stop now. <laughs> right. So you've got to allow for equilibration between the alveoli and the spinal cord. And once you do, you have a direct measure of the partial pressure of the anesthetic at whatever its site of action is. How long does that equilibration take? Depends on the agent you're using. It does depend. That's right. Uh, but if you said overall for the commonly inhaled anesthetics, how long would it be? 30 minutes. 30 minutes would be more than enough time. And, and what's usually allowed is 10 to 15 minutes. That's several time constants. We'll get to time constants in just a minute. So you anesthetize the animal at a concentration which permits movement and then at a concentration which prevents movement. That is, you bracket the concentration which might or might not permit movement. So if we were to anesthetize an animal with sevoflurane and hold the end tidal concentration at 2.1%, pinch the animal's tail, find no movement, we would go down, perhaps to 1.9%. We'd then allow equilibration to occur again, we'd simulate the tail, and this time when we stimulated the tail we found movement, we'd say that Mac lay halfway between these two concentrations. Now the problem that we get to in humans is that humans don't have tails. So how do we deal with that? How do we do it in humans? Which are really the animal of concern. Yes, how do we do it in humans? Titanic stimulus, or? We could use a titanic stimulus, uh, and that has been done. But what would you prefer? Skin incision. Say it loud. Skin incision. Loudly. Scout skin incision. <laughs> All right. That's right. We, we get our surgical colleagues to help us. But again, we only get one cut. So how are you going to deal with that? You need two cuts. 
You're going to ask the surgeon to make a cut and then wait and then make a further cut? Well, he has to or she has to wait for 30 minutes while you change the concentration? No, you're not going to do that, are you? So what are you going to do? I don't know. Okay. Anyone have a suggestion what you're going to do? How are you going to manage it? You have to determine the point at which one patient will move in response to surgical incision and figure out what the concentration is. And then the next patient, you figure out the concentration and you keep going somewhere in between until you get to 50%. So you use two patients instead of one. I think that's what you were saying, isn't right. it? Right. So if the first patient moves at a concentration of 1.1% isoflurane, in the second patient, you'll go up because this patient moved. And you keep on going up until you get no movement. And the bracketing concentrations, the one that permits movement and the one that prevents movement, are the ones that define MAC for that pair. And you gather four to six pairs of patients using that technique, which is called the Dixon up and down technique. And that defines MAC for inhaled anesthetics in humans. Now, we're going to show you a demonstration of MAC, or a demonstration of the determination of MAC, using the tetanic stimulation. And remember that we're watching the patient, or someone else is watching the patient while we're doing this. Mike, we had a very cooperative child this morning. And tell us what we tried to accomplish. Well, we uh, actually saw a couple of very interesting things. Uh, as uh, we noted, the uh, child was calm coming out, uh, very cooperative getting back um, onto the OR table. No premedication. No premedication whatsoever. The child actually held the mask up to his face, uh, helped us uh, start his own induction. Um, we turned the sevoflurane on. then gave him a painful stimulus on the right arm. And what did you notice at that point? Again, he had uh, some purposeful movement, uh, which again is consistent with uh, those low levels of MAC. That's right. And then uh, we deepened the anesthetic. And again, what happened when we stimulated his arm? Again, we still had given no additional rocuronium. Uh, so we know that uh, the muscle relaxant wasn't in play there. And uh, we saw no spontaneous movement. And that's uh, a reasonable demonstration of MAC in one patient, in one patient. So 1.5% tetanic stimulus, and then the child moved after that. And then at 2.5% with tetanic stimulation, although the, the response to the to tetany was there, there was no subsequent movement of the hand. So the MAC in that patient, we might say, would be about 2%. That's about what MAC is for sevoflurane. Now here are the resulting values from determinations of MAC in humans. If you talk about the MAC values in oxygen, they range from a low of 0.75% for halothane to a high of 105%. That's of what? 105% of what? Can you give 105%? Well, you can. Of what, though? I want you to say it loudly. Hyperbaric chamber. In a hyperbaric chamber. So it's 105% of one atmosphere. Of one atmosphere. Now clearly, you can't give 105% of nitrous oxide unless you're willing to go down to Death Valley. Well, never mind. And that is anesthetic for nitrous oxide. Now notice that this is for 30 to 60 year old subjects. And we're going to talk about age. But if we had a different age, the values would be different. And notice that nitrous oxide itself adds to the effect of halothane, isoflurane, sevoflurane, and desferane. So it reduces the, the MAC and does so roughly by a percent for each percent nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide produces a halving at 50 to 60 percent nitrous oxide of the MAC for desferane at this age. At this age. At different ages, it will differ. And we'll see that in a moment. Before we look at what factors change MAC, let me ask you what factors don't change MAC. What physiological factors don't change MAC? Name one. Gender. Gender doesn't change it. So it doesn't matter whether you're a male or a female. What else? Duration of anesthesia. Duration of anesthesia doesn't. Anything else? What else? What else? Body mass. Body mass. Sure. If you're fat or thin, you got the same MAC. Tall or short, you got the same MAC. You're a dwarf, 
Same Mac, same Mac. In fact, across species, the Mac doesn't change very much. Doesn't change very much. So here's an extension of that list. As long as you keep physiological factors reasonably normal, there's no change in Mac. Arterial PaCO2 above 50 millimeters of mercury, or PCO2 less than 80 millimeters of mercury, or a hematocrit that's greater than 10%, allows you to get down pretty low without changing Mac. Blood pressure above 50 millimeters of mercury doesn't change MAC. And here's one example of that, the example of duration. This was in some studies that we did in rats anesthetized with Desfrain, but the same thing is true for the other inhaled anesthetics. So the MAC was here at the start of anesthesia, and then five hours later, it's the same place, same place. No change, no change. So increasing duration doesn't affect anesthetic requirement. What are the physiological factors that do change MAC? Age. Age. How does it change MAC? Which way? It decreases your MAC as you increase in age. As you increase in age. What else? Temperature. Temperature. Tell me more about it. Uh, the lower your body temperature is, the less MAC it requires for the person to stay anesthetized. Right. Now, we said gender doesn't affect MAC. Is that true under all circumstances? Pregnancy um, lowers MAC. Pregnancy lowers MAC. The other factor is decreased central nervous system. Sodium will decrease MAC, so our increased. How can we ch get a change in central nervous system sodium? How could you get a change? What might you do? Under what clinical circumstances could this happen? Say it louder, James. Dehydration. Dehydration, right. What else? SIADH. I don't know what that is. Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Uh, right. Yes. You definitely could, could alter sodium. Um, cerebral salt wasting syndrome. OK. That would, that would seem to do it. What do we do that might do it? How many of you have, uh, have given anesthesia for a patient having a transurethral resection of the prostate? How many? What happens during that that might alter the sodium in the body? What else? The irrigation fluid that they use when they're actually um, looking at the prostate with the scope and then they are bovying out the prostate, some of that can be absorbed by the venous sinusoids yes. and make the sodium go down. And make the sodium go down. That's right. How can we make the sodium go up? How many of you have done uh, intracranial operations in which the surgeon has asked you to make the brain more slack? We've got one right there. How did you, how did you do it? How did you break the brain more slack? A couple of ways, but one was uh, infusing mannitol. And what would that do? It's an uh, osmotic diuretic. So we, uh, by doing so, we withdrew water from the brain parenchyma into the blood volume. And what would that do to the central nervous system sodium? Uh, would decrease it. Decrease it or increase it? If you take water away, what does it do to the sodium? Uh, would increase the sodium Would increase the sodium, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And in fact, that's one of the experimental ways we have increased sodium and shown the increase in MAC that results. This is the example of age and its effect on sevoflurane MAC. So we see the progressive decrease. Notice this, this is the log scale here. This is the sevoflurane MAC. And a progressive decrease in the MAC of sevoflurane. Each one of these is a separate full study with four to six or more, patient, uh, more crossings for sevoflurane. So you see a lot of studies that were done showing the progressive decrease. And notice the steeper decrease for sevoflurane in 60% nitrous oxide. That is, 60% nitrous oxide becomes itself a greater and greater fraction of MAC as age increases. So the same concentration of nitrous oxide adds much more to the anesthetic effect of an older patient than it does to the effect of a younger patient. Here's the effect of a change in body temperature producing, as was suggested, a decrease in MAC with decreasing body temperature, a halving of MAC for a 10 degree decrease in body temperature. Now, there are many pharmacologic compounds that will affect MAC. We already had one suggestion that alcohol will affect MAC. How will it affect MAC if you, if you drink? <laughs> uh, 
you can differentiate between acute and chronic alcohol. Right. And what's the differentiation between acute and chronic? Well, chronic alcohol will require more MAC. So you will increase MAC with chronic alcohol. As long as you're not drinking at the moment, right. the MAC is determined. And it will do the converse in the patient who is acutely drunk. All right. What else will affect MAC pharmacologically? Yes. Use of opioids. Use of opioids, which we do every day. We make use of that interaction to decrease MAC. And is that a synergistic or an additive effect? I believe it's an additive. Would everyone agree with that? <laughs> Obviously. You had a 50-50 chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And indeed, and indeed it's synergistic, and we'll show that in just a minute. Anything else? Yes. Benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines will decrease MAC. And do so how much? A little bit or a lot? A lot. A lot. Well, obviously, it's dose dependent, isn't it? Dose dependent. Absolutely. Can you achieve anesthesia with a benzodiazepine by itself? Yes. It's very hard. You have to give enormous doses. And even then, uh, many animals will move in response to stimulation. So um, you might be able to, but I think it would be very difficult. It would be very difficult. Okay, let's see a list of the depressant drugs that will decrease MAC. And it's what you would expect. And we have noted uh, these, the opioids, the benzodiazepines, the barbiturates, and of course propofol. Local anesthetics, not because they produce local anesthesia, but if you give them intravenously, if you give a lidocaine intravenously, it will decrease anesthetic requirement as defined by MAC. And of course nitrous oxide will decrease the requirement for potent inhaled anesthetics. Now here's a demonstration of the synergistic effect of fentanyl on sevoflurane MAC. So this is the sevoflurane concentration uh, that is MAC, and this is without any fentanyl. So here are the patients who moved in response to surgical stimulation, the brown, uh, I'm sorry, the blue dots and the open squares are the ones who failed to move. And the point of this slide is to show you that as we increase the serum fluoride levels, we never reach MAC, but there is an acute response at these lower concentrations, which almost equal the responses at much higher concentrations, suggesting the synergistic interaction between opioids and anesthetic requirements. So just that little dose of fentanyl that we give as part of the induction considerably alters anesthetic requirement as defined by MAC. Now we have a, an, an aura scene which uh, documents some of this. We had a patient who was at uh, about three quarters of a MAC, but with no fentanyl. And today we've given this patient what? Two mics per kilo of fentanyl. And we're at the same concentration of sevoflurane. We are. And now the question is, will this patient, unlike the previous one, not respond? What are you going to do here? Well, we're going to simulate uh, surgical incision uh, by tetanus and okay. see if this patient has any uh, spontaneous and purposeful movements. Tell us when you're going to do the tetanus. Okay, the tetanus is coming, and now. And we notice that there is no purposeful movement. Okay. Which is consistent with what we would expect. We know that uh, fentanyl or narcotics in general decrease our MAC values. And do so synergistically, don't they? Yes, they do. Okay, it's a good illustration of that. We see how fentanyl interacts synergistically to decrease the MAC. We saw that in the slide, and we saw that in the illustration in the operating scene. And I, I want to remind you all that in the operating room, while we're talking, someone is, in fact, watching the patient. Now, there, there are many drugs that we've already suggested that will decrease MAC. Those are pretty obvious drugs, like, like fentanyl or like midazolam. But there are some that are less obvious. And in fact, you had a question about that. Dr. Eager, and considering the um, definition of MAC, other drugs that aren't listed are things like muscle relaxants. Um, do those affect MAC? That's a good question. And y you would think about that in terms of the definition of MAC, mm -hmm. because the definition of MAC says what? Um, that 50% of the patients will not move to a noxious stimulus. And if you gave a muscle relaxant, what would that do? That would seemingly lower the MAC because no one would move. Right. So the MAC definition really has to include that this is a central nervous system phenomenon and not a phenomenon of paralysis. And in fact, it, it does, although that's an unstated part of the definition. But still, 
The question is, is there a central nervous system effect of muscle relaxants that decreases MAC? After all, what are muscle relaxants? What do they do? What do these neuromuscular blocking drugs do to produce blockade of impulses? Well, they prevent the transmission of the, electro, um, the motor impact potential at the postsynaptic junction by what? inhibiting acetylcholine receptors or blocking acetylcholine receptors. Right. So they block the receptors. They block them from the effect of acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a central nervous system transmitter too, isn't it? Yes, sir. So you might think, well, if the muscle relaxants got into the central nervous system, maybe they would decrease MAC. Maybe they would. That would be an interesting thought, wouldn't it? And in fact, we know that if you give muscle relaxants directly on the brain, like galamine, a muscle relaxant that we don't use anymore, it causes convulsions. So it can cause potent effects on the brain. Now, there are data that suggests that muscle relaxants do not affect MAC, and there is one study which suggests that it does. How would they ever study that? I'm not sure. Because you'd have to retain motor movement in the face of muscle relaxants getting to the brain of humans. How would you do it? What would you do to maintain the ability to move and yet get the muscle relaxants in the brain? Oh, I got a lot of hands here. All right, go ahead, tell us. A blood pressure cup or tourniquet, like they use in ECT, where you can put in some motor, you can put in the blocker, but you essentially block it to one portion of the body. Exactly. So you isolate one extremity from the circulation, and that's what they did. And they found in one case that they did show a smallish decrease in MAC, but in all the rest of the cases they did not. You would expect that there should be, in fact, no effect of muscle relaxants on the brain. Why is that? What is the characteristic of muscle relaxants that separates them from all the other drugs that we use in anesthesia? They don't usually cross the blood-brain barrier. Why? They are usually uh, polar agents. That's right. They're all ionized. So they can't get into the brain. So you would expect there to be no effect. Now, there are many other drugs that act on receptors. Might affect MAC. Name some of those. What other drugs might affect MAC? Clonidine. Clonidine. Or what's the other drug that's been released? Dexmedetomidine. Dexmedetomidine. <coughs> Dexmedetomidine. What does it do to anesthetic requirement? It decreases MAC. Decreases MAC. can decrease it to zero. That is, the dexmedetomidine can be an anesthetic itself. Anything else? Well, there are a whole list, whole list of these <coughs> drugs. So the alpha-2 sympathetic agonists like clonidine and Dexmedetomidine, some beta blockers, but not all of them. Calcium channel blockers, adenosine, and ATP, and false neurotransmitters can all influence MAC. So we see here the effects of de dexmedetomidine in the study by Vickery, published many, many years ago. And L-metatomidine, L-metatomidine uh, has no effect. It's only the dextrometatomidine that causes the decrease in anesthetic requirement. Let's go on to what we call MAC awake. We already have had the definition of MAC awake, which is the entitled concentration that suppresses appropriate response to command in 50% of subjects. Why is MAC awake important? What does it define? Because usually the MAC awake exceeds the MAC for amnesia. So hopefully if you're at MAC awake, hopefully you know you have amnesia at that point. Exactly so. So it's a the con it's a concentration that almost assures you of suppression of remembrance. Maybe not of all forms, but at least of most forms of remembrance. It's also a determinant of anesthetic recovery, isn't it? At MAC, patient's responding. So you, you would say that the patient is awake. And there's an element of safety to this, because a, an awake patient is more likely to maintain their airway. But it's not a complete assurance of safety. This is a slide showing the potential for regurgitation at concentrations that are in fact less than MAC. So this is 25% of MAC. There's an increased potential for regurgitation that is a relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter. 50%, it's even greater. And that's true of all the inhaled anesthetics. So the, quicker we can get down below MAC awake, and well below MAC awake, the better. We also know that uh, MAC awake is affected 
by at least some of the same factors that affect Mac itself. So age affects Mac awake. As you get older, the Mac awake goes down. We know that Mac awake can vary among anesthetics. And this is an, an important aspect of Mac awake relative to Mac. And Rory Dwyer and I studied this in uh, some volunteers, determining what concentration volunteers responded appropriately to command with isoflurane, and on a separate occasion in the same volunteers, what concentration suppressed response to command with nitrous oxide. And finding that as a multiple of MAC, there was a difference between the two, with nitrous oxide having a much higher MAC awake value, above 60% of MAC than isoflurane, which had a MAC awake value somewhere around 30 to 40% of MAC. What does this imply to you? What does it mean? Why is it important? Does anyone care? Try it, Michael. Well, it would help uh, in recovery time. So, you know, if you could recover, recover somebody more quickly, you could get them through the PACU a little bit more quickly. So which anesthetic would you choose? In that case, I would choose uh, nitrous oxide. Right. And it's one of the reasons why nitrous oxide continues to be so important. It, more than the potent inhaled anesthetics, allows recovery to occur quickly. Yes. But, but in that situation, you're saying that Mac Awake is around s a little over 60%. Um, of Mac. Correct. Well, with the Mac of nitrous oxide being 105. Right. So if you give, at best, 70% nitrous, you're, you don't have a very large window there between Mac Awake and the maximum amount you can deliver. So what do you have to do? You have to supplement in some you other way. You have to supplement. <clears throat> But that contribution of nitrous oxide still remains less of a factor in terms of awakening than does what you use to supplement it with, which might be propofol, or might be desferrin, or sevoflurane, or isoflurane. So the use of the nitrous oxide helps you in the rapidity of awakening. What's the downside of it? What's the downside of it? You, in fact, gave that answer already, didn't you? Uh -oh. <laughs> the MAC awake of nitrous oxide is very high, which means that it's what? Not a very good amnestic. Not a very good amnestic agent. So you have to give anesthetic to supplement it, not only because you don't want the patient to move, but because with 70% nitrous oxide, patients remember. It isn't sufficient in itself to suppress awareness. 